But first off today, I'm joined by a man I'm really looking forward to, to talking to. His name is Noel Whelan and he's Director of Training with the International Anti- and Counter-Terrorism Training Specialist. Noel, you're very welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for joining me. Noel, I suppose before we get into the nitty-gritty of what you do, a very interesting little story about you when you were a youngster. Nine years of age, was it? Yes, yes. Um, I was nine years old uh, and I think... Very interesting time. I was uh, at that point where you see the world in a very lovely way. You know, you're inspired your surroundings. But uh, it was a punctuation in my life. Uh, my mother asked me to go to the local shop in Dublin here, and of course uh, I went to the to the shop and I got a big surprise. I had. Uh, I, I, my mother, as mothers do say, just, you know, keep look after this money, don't lose it. You know, it's tight times, obviously, and uh, whatever happens. And I remember scrunching the money in my hand, protecting it. And uh, during my little time to the shop to get something, uh, there was an armed robbery. It was, it's a case of strange synchronicity. And um, while I was in the shop, uh, I had an, a shotgun stuck to my head at nine years old, threatening to blow my head off if the, if the lady behind the cash register didn't pass the money over in a very fast fashion to the man with the black mask, you know, with the eyeballs staring at me. And uh, that uh, that was a very interesting moment. And it only became later, apparently, in my life when people asked me, what started you on your journey? And uh, I, I never could quite point my finger on it. came out in a documentary once years ago that I was working on and then uh, it, it came apparent that that's what actually propelled me in my journey now. I've just turned 42 and that moment is what changed my life. I think I grew up very, very quickly from that moment, that punctuation. You must have been shell-shocked, like nine years of age. Did you hold on to your mum's money? No, well, well, the problem was I had a dog with me. I was one of these kids who was a loner. I held the money, I protected the money Good at man. all costs. But I was also trying to protect my dog, which had his teeth stuck into the armed robber's ankle, trying to bite him to protect me. So I have one man trying to shake a wire terrier off his leg with a mask and a red helmet on with a shotgun stuck in the, my forehead, my, my temples in my head, um, trying to call the dog off. And he just panicked and panicked and panicked. But, I, you know, I very nearly lost my life that day, you know, at nine years old. But one thing became very apparent very quickly. I noticed the man's hand shaking. Really, the adrenaline, was, now I know it was adrenaline all these years later. But uh, I, he wasn't a professional. He was quite the amateur when I think back from what I've seen subsequently over the years. But uh, that was very dangerous. There's two armed robbery, two armed robbers in the shop. But what really struck me, how they planned that. I went through it over and over and over again, the timing, the planning or getaway, all these types of things, the motorcycle that was used. So over and over and over again, over all these years, that's, in a way, um, it's kind of been a blessing that happened, although it did affect me for in different ways, you know. But, mm. uh, yeah, that's kind of what propelled <laughs> did me. Did they get away with much? Just uh, I don't know, yeah. but I know they got away with taking the innocence of many people that day. Yeah, of course. And as you said, it influenced you going on through your life. You sure. joined the Irish Army. Was that uh, to seek adventure in the world and maybe in a way to go down the path you're on now? Yeah, um, I, my family are all a military family here in Ireland. We go right back, you know. Um, we've always been involved in some sort of conflict over, even around the world for many years. But it was a family tradition, you know. Um, and I, I thought, not necessarily a follow for the family tradition. I did want adventure. I, I most of all wanted to see because I get through the training and what it was all about. I like mountains. I like the idea of the outdoors. I, I've always been a bit of an outdoorsman. And I thought that would give me a good challenge. And you got through that and spent yeah. some time there. But it wasn't for you. It wasn't challenging enough. Is that fair to say? Um, the training was excellent. My colleagues were great. Everything was great about it. But it just wasn't for me. I did. Uh, I think I did about seven or eight years. But something else was eagerly biting at me during those times because I had that experience younger I was more interested in timing planning strategy synchronicity but I was fascinated by the world around me different conflicts but you know Ireland at the time were giving a lot of troops to the United Nations and peacekeeping but what I was interested in was real politic I was interested in extreme violence and why people want to kill other people and it sounds terrible but it, that's what happens why people go the extra mile in pursuit of political and ideolog ideological aims and uh, I wasn't going to get that here so I had something was drawing me to the bigger picture and I really needed to understand that and then uh, that journey took me around the world over 20 years so you've worked uh, uh, on the front line in yeah. dangerous situations Absolutely, with yeah. big organizations as well in counter-terrorism I see as part of your CV you mentioned Homeland Security there in the US yeah, you've yeah. worked with them yeah what I did was I've been over the last eight years I've been going back and forth to the United States and what happens is the first Homeland Security program down in 
uh, Texas, uh, Southeast Texas, was set up by a very good friend now after all these years by a, a chief, J.P. Doan. So I was going back and forth. To, see, everyone who does Homeland Security programs in the U.S., they're very clever because what they've done is they've said, look, in order, to, in order to protect our nation, we have to understand how other nations see our nation. So all the people who wish to work, all the students who want to work in the military, Homeland Security, um, they need to have a good grounding in sociology, understanding politics, all those factors. So I was brought down to uh, to Texas. I think I've been there about five, six, seven times maybe. Um, and I would actually go in, take all the students to, to understand why people want to attack your country. But what I would actually do is I have one of these strange minds. I think it's completely outside the box. But it's very suitable to this field with profiling, understanding. So what I would do is I would actually work at how countries could be brought to their knees in a very quick way. How systems and infrastructure could be closed down. For example, use of the internet, critical infrastructure protection. And the only way to protect the nation and homeland security is to learn how it can be sh- shut down. So you reverse engineer the process. And that's how my kind of mind works. But very luckily for me, I work in the counter-terrorism field. But what I also do is I teach anti-terrorism, which is the prevention. And it's only when we get to counter-terrorism is because somebody's messed up. We haven't seen an opportunity coming. And that's reaction. But anti-terrorism is preventative, proaction, prophylactic methods of avoidance. And that's where my key skills come in. So we teach them how to prevent, but what happens when the prevention is finished? We can't. We now move into a different field, which is counter. So I still train SWAT teams. I still actually teach firearms. I teach the planning. I teach how to protect rail stations, aviation, all those factors where large congregations of people come together. That's where the target list is, as from what I can see in my 21 years of preparing for what I do now, is how to protect people in and around areas, locations, and uh, even travelling. I even get so many people asking me where should I go on holiday this year. It's unbelievable the amount of people contact me. Where should I not go? Where should I go? And my answer is very clear. If you're going to a country that has a problem and you really want to go there, my advice is this. Find the busiest most luxurious location on that place, that resort, find it where all the people congregate, identify it, and then avoid it like the plague, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Simple as that. That's what I mean. If you, want, if you really, really feel you have to go there, that's my philosophy on it. Avoid it. That, that Homeland Security, that is you actually working with people in the States, teaching them, just Absolutely, to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah, your yeah. expertise yeah, being yes, used yes, there yes. to prepare them. Yeah. Can I ask you from where we sit here today yeah. in Ireland in the North East, Ireland, terrorism, terrorism, Terrorist threat or whatever. We had the troubles. It still murmurs on beneath the scenes a bit. You know, Republican, Mm. Unionist, etc. in the country here and their paramilitaries. But thank God it's an awful lot better than it was. Is Ireland, you know, does it face a terrorism threat beyond these shores or from something else within these shores? Well, I, can I just look, I'll, look, I'll answer that in just a couple of parts. Is that okay? First of all, what we're dealing with modern terrorism, terrorism is a phenomenon, okay? It's not something you can sit down and go, oh yeah, it's this, it's that. There's over 157 definitions internationally of terrorism. Now the problem with that is when you have so many definitions that cannot be built into international law, the search goes on and on. But what's happening is you have one country saying one terrorism one terrorist is a freedom man, a freedom fighter in this country. Then we say terrorism this in this country. So what happens is because we have no international definition That causes problems with international law. So what's happening is terrorists move around locations. It's a transnational concept. Now, if you have a country that's really sharp, but deal has good anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism policies, good police and good systems and good experiences problem, they're going to be fairly sharp. So if you're a budding person who wants to create violence on, on, to achieve political aims, you're going to find somewhere where you can hide out. Now, I'm not saying that we have a big problem in Ireland, but we you have to look at it this way. Terrorism affects us in many different ways. So if you want to get to another country and attack their homeland security, to attack their nation from the external, are you going to come from a country that has a reputation of having problems, or are you going to try and seek somewhere that's... Uh, off the radar, as they'll say. So you say in Ireland is off the radar, that we're sort of soft here, we're easy. Well, you see, everyone loves the Irish. You know, we're a party-loving people. We're a nation of party lovers and musicians and stuff like that. So I'm not saying we are. I'm not saying we are not. But like everything else, it's what other people, do they see us as an opportunity to come here, to hide out, to extract the external? But if you look at it another way, Irish people are affected by terrorism. How many Irish people were killed in the 9-11 towers? It wasn't just people of the United States. How many Irish people have travelled across the different holiday destinations and get caught up in political violence? The problem is terrorism affects 
everyone. And it's only, even as our little nation would have to have an anti and counter-terrorism pol- policy. But you see, we have so much history of political violence in this country. We are out there now. We have so much to share, so much knowledge and experience to give. We're actually coming. We've gone through so much. Still a long way to go. But we still have a lot to offer people who are looking how little island like ours manages to deal with our problems. Still a long way to go, but we've a lot to offer. But we're not really under threat here, are we, from anybody within the country or without? We're little old Ireland, as you say. You know, yeah, nice yeah. place to yeah, live. Yeah, yeah. We're not a big population. We don't have big pull in the world. So, you know, what's at stake here, really? Is is that a comfort to say that to listeners today? Well, let's look and have a look at our little island of Ireland. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we'll take... Uh, again, this is just media speculation. I don't work for the media. But terrorism does need the media to, to, to get its point across. If you look at the attack on the Kenya shopping centre, first of all, uh, I think I'm going to miss... Long way to a length way to the lady that was the white wi- the white widow who was involved in this allegedly planned the attacks in Kenya, on the West Westgate Mall. Apparently, it came in the newspaper she was Irish. It was all over the newspapers in the world. Irish, the the white widow who was the uh, the you know the, the main leader of the bombing and the attack on she the. She had Westgate an Irish Channel. passport. She's an Irish, but she was actually Irish. Uh, two weeks ago, um, apparently there was a man locked up in the United Kingdom because uh, he had uh, threatened the life of Prince Harry. He had threatened to kill him, and using the advanced stage, he was a Muslim convert from Ireland. Now, you see, where this looks at for Ireland, people will be looking, oh, hang on, what's happening in our little country here, our little rock and roll nation where we produce U2 and all these wonderful bands and musicians? We have five, six million people in this country. We have the capacity for 55 million people on the island of Ireland. Now, if you are going to be moving around different countries, and this is what you find with people who want to commit these acts of terror and crime, when they move around from island to island, Ireland, Ireland is one of these not what we call non schengen countries. Now let's put it this way: If we weren't seen as what do you could, mean by non-Schengen? Non-Schengen, the Schengen Agreement is a docu- is, is an agreement between the European Union nations where people of Europe can travel from country to country, and they don't necessarily have to have a passport. They can actually travel freely. But there are people who opted out of the Schengen Agreement, and that's Ireland and the UK. Now you'd have to ask yourself why that is. Now I'm not a politician. So is that, that good though that we did? Um, I think it's interesting and significant <laughs> because we remember we're the last remaining island in Europe that's not connected by a bridge or a tunnel if you look at it that way so when people would like to come here for whatever reasons I think Ireland would be a fairly good place to hang out to be honest Mm. Uh, the the intention is going to be off you the only good thing is here everyone's nosy in Ireland everyone watches everyone and what are you doing tomorrow what are you doing who's that everyone waves at you and people notice things so you know that's the problem with the concept of international terrorism. When we look at terror, we have to look at the capability, the credibility and the intent of the people or organisations who wish to carry out terrorist attacks. Now, if they're being watched in one area, it, they will move to another area to carry out these attacks. It happened in Spain, it happened in Morocco, it happened in Egypt. It happened in many different countries where people move from one location to the next. And that's how we could be affected by this problem. And one second, we break. Noel Whelan, he's a counter anti terrorism expert. He's with us on late lunch today. Yes, to anti and counter terrorism expert Noel Whelan is with me on late lunch this afternoon. Noel, can I ask you a question uh, that often uh, puzzles me? Who is the big threat in terms of terrorism in the world today? We've, of course, we heard about Al Qaeda for years, and the, the US went after Al Qaeda after the 9 11 Taliban, of course, in Afghanistan. Who is it? Well, if I could just take you back to Al-Qaeda for a second. Al-Qaeda has morphed many, many times since what we knew as the first original Al-Qaeda, which came to notoriety and the 9-11 attacks. But Al-Qaeda per se is still not defeated and can never be defeated because you're not dealing with like in World War 2 or World War 1 where the allies of the world had to define the enemy who wore the uniform they're over there we're over here they mix in they immerse themselves amongst population it's an irregular asymmetrical type of war which means it's unbalanced there's no identity they don't wear markings who's a terrorist or not but the big powerhouse behind Al-Qaeda was not if you look study and this is my interpretation uh, Bin Laden was the what we call the brains to the uh, sorry the, the the body to the brains. The real mover and shaker behind Al Qaeda was always a guy called Ayman Al Zawahiri, who was an Egyptian, a doctor. Now he is believed to be the new leader of uh, Al Qaeda. Now the interesting thing is he's a doctor under the Hippocratic old kind of thing. He's supposed to protect people, but um, Al Qaeda has morphed many, many, many different times. And terrorism is like a cell; it moves. It's like a cancer. To use that, excuse the expression, but it moves and it morphs and it changes 
changes and morphs again. So just as you think you've got an idea of this, it morphs again and morphs again. But what happens is that masters now of propaganda. So what's happening, the threat level has gone from a, a concept to multitudes of different philosophies, different groups of people. But we're starting to see the age profile is getting younger and younger and younger. So the real threat now is becoming, and the, the, again, it's, it's just my own studies of X amount of years. It's not just, you know, we've had doctors trying to blow themselves up at airports in Glasgow. Doctors, what's happening here? Because they come on under the radar. They come in low so you can't see them. Built, making acetone peroxide in bathtubs near universities in Leeds. We've had people all over the world who you would never expect. So what's feeding this ideology? Now, if we can just move, because, and I'd like to point out that not every Muslim is a terrorist. I need to talk about radical Islam for a second. We're starting to see in the likes of North Africa, what's happening is we're starting to see drought. We're starting to see the effects of climate change. We're starting to see all these factors where people are migrating because of problems. Now, that in itself causes problems because you have different migrations, different tribes, different tribalism, and that increases sectarianism. And you get people opening up radical mosques, radical speakers, radical preachers saying, look, the reason why you can't drink, you can't feed your family, you can't, you're starving is because this group or ideology are buying all the country. They own everything. So if you want to get yourself back, you can fish again, you can do this. And there's evidence for this. You will have to go on jihad. And jihad, to them, is a different interpret. The word jihad in Arabic means to strive personally to make yourself a better person. And it actually forbids Muslims to kill Muslims as well, but that's what's happening. So they've taken a whole new concept and radically interpreted the word jihad from what it absolutely doesn't mean into something they believe to be to encourage these younger people who can't see, feel, understand and interpret the world from lack of being able to read, write and basically the wisdom to see the world and understand it through your own eyes. I mean, we see that in all different cultures and religions, people doing things because they haven't got the maturity to make decisions for themselves. And they've got somebody saying the reason why this is is because you have to go, you are obliged to carry out these acts and activities. So Al-Qaeda is still a massive threat around the world and will be for some time, you're saying to me. Yeah, of course it is. Al-Qaeda is a morphed threat. And, and, and it's against Western philosophy, freedom, what? But you know, what we understand yeah, yeah. in this country to it's be not the way just, we live. Yeah, it's not just against... All you have to do is go back through the statements and you change the... You, you, if you study the words behind the words of, say, Bin Laden's statements... What happens when you when you when you when you decrypt him? What he's actually saying: this is a war of civilization. He's threatened the lands. He's threatened the world. Unless you convert, he actually threatened the United States, saying, "If you don't convert to Islam, you will be targeted forever." Now that's a huge statement. That's a strategic statement, and people forget about that. If you don't convert to Islam, or if we take uh, other statements of threats to say Spain, other countries, if you don't vacate the lands of Muhammad, we will kill you. You know, you will be targeted. So this is not just about a couple of people who make McDonald's shops around the world. This is a huge statement to different philosophies. I mean, if I could just read this yesterday to you, from, uh, I just picked up this on the way back home last night on the newspaper. Uh, this is a statement here from uh, Baroness Warsi uh, talking about violence. She's speaking at uh, the, the Sultan Grand Mosque in Oman, just recently. She says, religious sectarianism is causing tension, turmoil and terrorism in the Middle East and is starting to be seen in Britain, a cabinet minister has warned. Baroness Warsi said the violence between Sunni and Shia Muslims is a great danger to the world and must be confronted. That is very powerful. She says this infighting is rarely confronted, but is something which I feel possesses a great danger to faith and to our world. Now, that's a very senior public figure speaking on the subject in the Middle East. The problem with travel today and you know, if we go back 150, I think 100 years, how long would it take to travel from here to Africa? Mm. How long would it take to sail across America? We can send a text message in a second to people in the United States. We can send emails. In fact, the, one of the biggest problems now is anonymity of terror because people using the computer, the Internet, the Internet is not safe. The internet controls structures, it controls water treatment plants, it controls 
airline tra- uh, ticketing systems. It controls everything, and we depend on that. But the problem is most of the world's critical critical infrastructure is connected to the internet, which people like to access their emails from. So if we take that to another stage, people can actually access a water treatment plant in another country to mix chemicals from the home front room in another country, as long as they have the ability to code, encode, and actually decrypt tech if that's how it easy it is now. i'm worried i'm worried with all you're telling me because you're you're painting a picture of a very dangerous scenario in the world and one that yeah. is not going to go away and one that needs more people like you and people working in this area is that fair to say well, and that's absolutely true but i'd like to point out that of my jury i still remain an optimist because i you know <laughs> what are pessimists only well-informed optimists you know <laughs> But what we have to do is, as the tactic, the techniques, tactics and strategy of international terror change, we must change our tact. I still believe, maybe I'm naive, that the world can coexist no matter what civilization people come from. Sorry, what religion, what denominations, what are poli- people can exist and we can grow. But the problem is not other people see people like rationally minded people. There are people out there who will carry out absolutely heinous, horrendous crimes in the pursuit of political aims. And I say political, and it, my definition of political is not the likes of Minister Alan Shatter with a bug in his office and the garage, nothing like that at all. That's my definition of political uh, politics. And when I study like, politics at university, it comes to this. I like to think like our old friend Aristotle from ancient Greece. He says, politics is about people coming together to live, but not just to live, but to live well. That's politics. And that sits really well with me. But when people don't exist well, then we're going to have our caveats. Then we're going to have our problems. Then people go on the extreme. And that is part of the human condition. So on the positive, I'll get to the positive bit in a second. In order to change the nature of humanity, I think we have to change the hard drive in humans and that desire to pursue. We're going to change the hard drive app and use it too. <laughs> Stay with us, Noel Whelan. No, Llewellyn's an expert in anti and ter- uh, counter terrorism, and he's with us in late lunch today. No, uh, why women and terrorism? You know, you know, up to a point quite some time ago, this you know, boys fight, men yeah, fight, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But you're seeing now more and more women being used. Why is that? Well, it's it's really interesting because um, if we put it into this context, why women we're seeing more women being used is because mainly they avoid detection. You know, traditionally, you see, um, <laughs> from an operational perspective, you know, you don't. Most people don't expect because women stay at home, women wash. That's not my perspective, but that's the perception. Women work in the house, look after the family. But usually, it's because you avoid detection. They get better access to buildings because they can flirt, they can walk past people, they can use their, you know, femininity to get past men. They're more expendable, sadly. In the, in in, for say, radical Islam, they see them as, and this has been well documented. They are more expendable. They get more press. They get public attention. The more beautiful they are, that's what they. If you notice, all women suicide bombers, they're not exactly like. They, 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 sorry, they, they're, they're actually quite pretty. They deliberately choose pretty ladies, beautiful ladies for this. And they gold men into action. So there is a, a rationale or a reason behind this. There's why. an absolute strategic, technical and technical advantage to using women in these scenarios. While we've been talking, I've been just thinking here, war as it was traditionally known was two armies. You saw yeah. the two colours, they did battle, whatever, and yeah. ground and air by sea or whatever. But would but this be fair to say that what's going on are wars around the world, you know, sort of under the radar, like governments in yeah, place yeah. and yet a war yeah. happening that's yeah, not an, yeah. an official war as such? Yeah, it's what we call war by proxy. Um, that's, that's the technical name for it. So what happens is whenever two nations are at war, for example, when the, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda was in the caves in Afghanistan, when the attacks happened on America, this is an example, uh, America couldn't retaliate using its full force against the people of Afghanistan because it wasn't the people of Afghanistan that carried out the attack. It was what we call non-state actors acting behind the people of Afghanistan. So it takes a different type of conflict. But... This type of war changes the whole nature of modern conflict. So what you're seeing is you can send a whole army to deal with four or five men operating in another country that has potential to attack a country. So what we're dealing with is now starting to see more of what we call preventative rather than preemptive strikes. 
they're taking up preventative strikes now. So what happens is armies are starting to mobilise themselves into smaller groups, special operations. So more traditional, uh, conventional army soldiers are being trained into smaller groups, fours and fives, to be able to drop into a country at will. For example, Tier 1, uh, say US, the Navy SEALs will be on patrol around the world and they can actually be parachuted or dropped in surreptitiously into a country to actually deal with a conflict and prevent it from getting to the next stage. So that's what's happening more and more often. But these types of conflicts have always been happening around the world. Not necessarily one country, but one county, one border, one region across. It, it, that's what's happening. It happens in South America. We've seen it in the Middle East. We're starting to see other types of conflicts coming up. The revolutions in the Middle East over the last couple of years, the ousting of uh, leaders. These are all happening all the time. This is geopolitics. This is how the international security environment works. And this is how countries protect themselves in their environment. Self-defense of your nation means coping with threat in your environment, but our environment changes from minute to minute to minute. If you take, for example, what's happening in Ukraine as a powder keg, well, let's look at that for a second. Russia is a, has traditionally always been a very military strong nation. I mean, look at the Cold War. Uh, you know, uh, World War Three was a war by proxy. They couldn't come together with the US, so they fight in different places because they know what we have is what we call the mad system of defence, mutually assured destruction. That's what it was called strategically, nuclear, thermonuclear war. So what happens is they carry on these activities behind the scenes because it's posturing. It's basically pushing your views, pushing all these factors about your nation and how you survive but it's been happening for a long long period of time if it wasn't happening we wouldn't have NATO we wouldn't have the United Nations it is happening all the time again I come back to it obviously guys like you and people involved in this mm. business are going to be busy for a long long time because this is the way of the world you're saying to me but it always has been the way of the world and sadly it is the way of the world but I believe in the world I, I like to see myself as an idealist but I also have to remain as a realist because the world I would like to live in is not here yet. Will it ever get there? I would hope so. But sadly, it's not. And the factors need to be viewed. So we need to start studying. And part of the course I developed is to basically teach people and let them explore, find the answers for themselves. You know. So what we'll do is we look at uh, techniques, tactics, and strategy. We look at political, we look at religious violence, we look at what is crime, what is terror, we take you on that journey. And what I do is, in my course, I actually take people to think inside the mind of the terrorist. What is the terror? Now remember, I like to break the word terrorism down to, to terror, to terrorise and the terrorist, because they're three different concepts. And when we join those three together, looking at what, from like the last X amount of years in attacks, what is the most likely place based on the balance of probability, but also using our ingenuity, what makes the favourable to get the results. Then we put you into the field of the anti encounter terrorism specialist, and that doesn't mean policeman, soldier, government, that means politician, lawyer, legal people, the, the man standing doing security in the middle of a town centre, the, the person standing in the chip shop on the corner of a very vulnerable area, standing there 15 years making chips, and suddenly he sees somebody or a car very strangely. What's that about? You know, we all have to work together. So my concept is if we have a large congregation of people that really get into grips with this subject, you know, we do it online now. People can actually take this course online. What happens is, can you imagine when they're all trained, educated and understand more how we can actually come together to deal with the phenomenon that is terror? So as we study, you know, capability, credibility, intent of individuals, lone wolves, groups, whatever, can you imagine how we will actually utilise the capability, credibilities in ourselves and our resources to meet a threat head on? We all have a part to play. Now, you are offering this course, a Diploma in Anti-Encounter Terrorism Studies. Yes. What do you need to, to go on this course? Well, what we did is, myself and the colleagues who uh, built this course at IAX, we, 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 we sat down at the start of the journey and um, we, we actually, who, who, who really needs this course? And it came out that it wasn't just military, police, government personnel. It was actually people, train drivers, Bus conductor, all these types of people who are in and around large congregations or where people are coordinating their movements all the time. So critical infrastructure, IT specialists, we had um, AV airports, search staff. You know, we've had so much uh, in inquiries. We've had people, we've had a load of uh, people asking us questions from India where the real problems are, you know. Um, and, but what's happening is the people who need this type of training then more from the people who want to take this on as a career because this is not going to get any easier but what's happening is we're getting more dependent on the internet 
water production, electricity, gas production in different parts of the world, critical infrastructure, the aviation. So what happens is people will want to go into the consultancy field and this is the perfect way to get them into a field in speciality immediately. So anybody listening today who mm. has a reasonable educational qualification, is that what you're looking for? No. Do they have to have worked in a particular area, no. maybe security, anything like that? No, no nothing no. like we, that. We've come it's back open. with that. What happens, my, one of my colleagues at the Ajax, I, I basically, we, we sat down with this and we discussed this really deeply. He said, this is, terrorism is like a grassroots movement. We need to bring this down to grassroots. We need to make this as accessible to the people as possible. So anyone can go on this diploma Absolutely. course. Yeah. How do they get in touch with you if they're interested? Well, they can actually, I'll leave the details with you as well, Jared. You can go to www.iax.com. That's www.iacts.com. And uh, all the information is there on the website and they can check out. And we keep an international blog every day of the world's events for people also. It's fascinating stuff. You, uh, you've certainly found your niche in life. You're passionate about it. <laughs> Wish you well and thank, thank you for you, joining Jared. me today. No, really, thank you.